All right, so hello everyone. This is Marad. I'm here with Carson of the Callas Now Boys. Um, I guess you could describe them as like a, a mathcore band. Is that is that something that you would be okay with as a description of your band? Sure. I'm I'm whatever anybody wants to call us. That's yep. that's fine by me. So yeah, I'm I'm here with Carson Pace, vocalist of the Callas Now Boys. So thanks for joining us today. Hey, Carson. thank you for having me. So. I thought that I'd just kick, kick start this interview with the basics, pretty much. Just if you could provide us with a brief introduction of yourself, what you do in this band, the Callous Dow Boys, um, a little bit kind of an introduction to the band and the process behind your formation, because I see that you guys are quite a large band. I mean, you have eight members. So obviously, you know, it must be the way that you form must have been pretty interesting. So if you could just go into like a brief introduction of those of the band, pretty much, and who you are. Sure. Uh, my name is Carson Pace. Uh, I am a, a founding member and uh, lead singer of the Callous Dow Boys. Um, we have been a band since 2016. Um, we will uh, be a band until uh, one of us dies or something. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know what's going to uh, stop us at this point. Knock on wood. Um yeah, uh, we are sometimes eight people. We are uh, we fluctuate between six and eight. Um, uh, touring with eight people gets really expensive. Touring with seven people gets slightly less expensive, but um, still expensive. So, uh, I would say that we're six to eight, uh, six to seven members uh, at any given time. Mm -hmm. Um, uh we formed in 2016 um after uh our guitar player maddie and i um we had been in a like pop rock band for two or three years or so um and um we were pretty uh we were pretty tired of um dealing with everybody in that band um yeah. So uh, started something we, new, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah. And I wasn't even really supposed to be the singer. Um, we had a different person singing, and uh, he never showed up to practice. So I just, I just kind of became the singer. So, um, Wait, what, uh, what instrument did you originally play? If you played an instrument, um, I, I originally played guitar. Um, oh, okay, I see. And I, I technically still do sometimes for this band, uh, just in studio, never live. Um. That might change on an upcoming tour. Uh, I might have to play some extra guitar while someone else plays piano. But uh, you know, it's a it's a little back and forth. Um, you know, um, I don't know what else I can tell you about the band. I mean, no, that's um, a pretty. I mean, no, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good rundown. Of everything of the introduction. It's just it's kind of interesting for me to imagine um, a band like the Callous Style Boys forming out of the ashes of a pop rock band. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Like, no. I mean. It's, I mean, I no, think, that's a bad thing. It just seems like they're yeah. quite an evolution, definitely, like a musical evolution. So that's just interesting. I definitely. think so. I think that I I always wanted the pop rock band to sound like Dow Boys, and nobody else wanted it to. So. I mean, there's still those those yeah, more are. like poppy elements that I heard on new album, Celebrity Therapist. And, um, you know, speaking of, of that album, the, the way I really discovered it and the way that I discovered your band was through a music video for... Uh, what is delicious who swarms which is just an amazing song and, and pretty much the, the thumbnail intrigued me right from the start you know I just thought the visuals of it were really interesting and then when I clicked on the song you know it didn't disappoint like the just the dynamics on that like the, the math core craziness everything it was insane I love the music video as well like the visuals are really interesting and then that was kind of what led me to check out the rest of the album celebrity therapist and and you know your band the band in general but in regards to that one specific song, there are a couple of things that caught my attention. Um, first was it was okay. almost there was almost a sense of deja vu that I got when I saw the title, and I was a bit confused as to why. You know, it just seemed familiar, and then I I remembered that um, that title is what's on the album cover for this pretty this interesting album um, of Natural History by Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum. Um, That's you know, right. Which is an amazing album, and it's definitely something that I think any fan of this of your band should listen to. In, in my opinion, absolutely. But, so I was just, you know, I was wondering, like, is so is the title of the song an homage to Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum, and have you been influenced by them, like musically, non musically? Because like, I think not many people probably picked up on that reference. So 
if you could. Oh, no, I, I don't think I, Murad, you are the first interviewer to pick up on it. Um, oh, really? Wow. Which, uh, that's why this is, this is like, dude, um, I'm just going to be very frank with you. Like our manager was like, you have three interviews today. And I like rolled my eyes, but, uh, this is awesome. Like this <laughs> is the best one by far. So, um, thank you, man. Uh, thank you for, oh. for bringing that up. Um, I love that band so much <laughs> um, of natural history is in my top 10 albums of all time. If not my top three, um, I think that album is so brilliant uh, is like an all time. Listen for me. Um, I listen to it probably once a month <laughs> um, and I yeah. have since I discovered it in 2016 or something like that. Um, I love that band and and they're a huge influence on us. Um, and I I catch myself uh, ripping them off uh, occasionally, and and we have to stop ourselves and go back <laughs> and rewrite things because I'm like ah that sounds like a sleepy time riff that which like you know in some ways I think that it might be flattering, but you know I I don't want any instance of someone being able to be like you copied that from yeah you know exactly. a band I mean, from twenty years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I just think I, I I completely agree. Sleepy Time Gorilla Museum, just such a slept on band. Like I feel like a lot Absolutely. of people, I feel like a lot of people that like bands that are kind of that either influence them or are similar to them in some way. Just either they haven't heard of them or they never really checked that material. But yeah, they're just amazing and definitely of natural history is like one of my one of my top albums. Actually, I think I like um, I like their third album a little bit more actually. If I, you know, in like, glorious it, times, yeah, you in like glorious, in glorious times. times. I, I actually, I do like. You're in, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I like in glorious times a bit more. Am I just because? Um, it might be because the first song that I ever listened to by them was "Helpless Corp- Corpses Enactment," and then because I saw the music video, mm, I thought, sure. what is this? You know, it might be, that might be the effect. But I mean, yeah, like all all three of their wow. albums are amazing. So it's 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 splitting hairs at that point, you know. But I'm, I'm gonna be I, real with you, I. Uh, in glorious times has yet to click for me like really? i've listened wow. to it so many times and i know it's good but it's yet to like really hit me i'm sure it will one day yeah, yeah i mean th- i'd say there was a little bit of a shift in the style like not a dramatic shift but you know that, sure. that might be a factor but and i mean in regards to to the music on the new album like and then as i listen to it more and more i feel like i could definitely hear like more of the sleepy time influences in there like when I, I'd For say sure. one thing that stood out to me, I don't know if this is like, this was a part of the thought process, but like the way that the violins are used, because you guys are, are really unique for like, ha- you know, having a violin player at all. And within this type of, of, of sound, I felt like the way the violin yeah. is, used, which like, you know, not most of the time, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem to be used in like a melodic kind of like you know well i see a lot of like metal bands use the violin for like interludes like you know the little gentle acoustic interludes of otherwise like sure. songs like the way that you guys use it is like still in the abrasive context like it it, it kind of accent- accentuates the dissonance and to me that's something that definitely is within like the sleepy time ethos and so i mean oh for you, sure like if you want to comment on like the, of the use of violin in this band like the, the role that that plays I'd love to hear it. Of course. Um, I mean, that is, uh, again, you're killing it with these interview questions because I think most of the time the question is, how did you come up with the idea for a violin and not, uh, I, it, this is why I think the violin use is interesting. So you are still killing it, Murad. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, um, there's like a, there's a way to use the violin that would be probably gimmicky. Um, and since we started this band, we knew that that wasn't what we wanted to do. Um, we thought that was kind of stupid and like, like, we're not going to have like hoedown parts or we're not <laughs> yeah. going to have like, you know, yeah, but giant I'm, I'm looking up between the buried and me. If you, if you know, yeah, that. exactly. <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite bands, oh, but, yeah, I like like, too, but yeah, we're just, we're are... not going to do that. Yeah. It's people... been done, you know? Um, and, uh, I mean, when it comes to the violin, like, for for example like the way that it's used in like the psycho score or the way it's used in the score for the shining like it's used in an abrasive scary manner um 
and you know i'm listening to <laughs> i listen to uh movie scores more than i do real music uh real quote unquote music um and i mean i think a lot of that is like you know when we're writing songs we want to write something cinematic similar to and uh, thank you for the compliment on our our music videos i work oh. very hard to make those cinematic and you know i think that we're obsessed with our songs being little movies little vignettes um and I think the violin being sort of this way of uh, shocking somebody, like, I mean, it, it sometimes it sounds like a fucking electrical plug, you know what I mean? Or it <laughs> yeah, feels that way. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think that scaring the shit out of the audience using a foreign instrument is way cooler than just like, than, you know, using it for interludes or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I definitely, you know, that that's psycho. Uh, kind of like horror movie sound. I feel like that's something that I picked up on the album. You know, very yeah. So very. Oh, sure. I'll, I'll I'll just you know I'll give you outright compliment up. Very interesting use of the violin. That was something I really dug a lot. Um, Thank you. So and much. then also you know continuing with with the same theme of this of this one song because there's a lot to talk about it. Um, in regards to the music video, I thought that the the imagery in that video was really interesting, especially um all like the band members in the in the in the different colored hoods. I thought that was really interesting. And I don't know if this was intentional, but it reminded me a little bit of the album cover of uh, Francis the Mute by the Mars Volta, where it's um the guy, it's the guy in the car and he has like this red hood on his face. And then there's a doppelganger in the background. I'm not, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with it, but you know, nonetheless, really cool imagery. And that type of imagery is also in the album art where it's like, you know, it looks yeah. like, I guess it's the band members and they're kind of in a circle in a field with the hoods on. So I was wondering if you, sure. if you could tell us about, you know, like the, the visual and and design as and the artwork aspects of, I guess, not just, the, not just that song, but kind of the album and the band in general, just anything about the symbolism, the meaning, anything along those lines. Sure. Well, I mean, like the artwork and the visuals, um, I mean, down to our merch designs, like um, very, very important to us. Um, you know, like we are uh, a band that very much knows that what we're selling is not just the music. We're selling the imagery and we're selling, you know, effectively ourselves, you know, we're selling our personalities. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with the album artwork, we went with uh, someone whose art I had admired for a really long time, Sean Mundy's artwork. Um, and, uh, you know, I was basically just like, hey, here are the themes of the record. Um, I know you don't really work with color, but um, if there's a way to interject color into one of your pieces, like kind of a rainbow effect thing, um, you know, I, I would I would be interested in exploring that. And I think the, his way of putting color into the album artwork was the was the hoods. Um, so, um, you know, I was I was incredibly impressed by the piece. And, you know, of, of course, like Francis, the mute was in the back of my mind because that's mm -hmm. another one of my like top three albums of all time. Uh, yeah. Um, Fine. and, uh, you know, it was, it was of course in the back of my mind, but like, it wasn't an exact copy. Um, yeah. I see. and mm -hmm. you know, I, I was like, it's, it's more of an homage than anything. Um, I mean, if the Mars Volt is upset about it, you know, we'll change the artwork, <laughs> whatever. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't um, think they invented, uh, you know, a people in colored hoods. No, I don't, I don't think yeah, they so did don't... either, but they did perfect yeah. it. Um, that's true. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I love that band. And, uh, I mean, the visual style with them, I mean, uh, as far as our visual style goes, they're one of our biggest influences with the visual style. You know, the, those albums I don't think would be as intriguing to me if they didn't have the artwork that they have, you know, the amputecture artwork, the better oh, yeah. Goliath artwork, like, you know, it would, it would not be as impactful. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, while of course we want to make art that is as good as those records, you know, we're not trying to make those records exactly. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud that it's a nice homage, but I, I also think there are people who, have never listened to that record or who don't care about that band who, who really like the artwork. So yeah. Um, yeah. There you yeah. go. Um, so in regards to, you know, so I guess some of the lyrical themes of the album, and this is something that's on the band campus description. Some of the broader themes are seem to be like, you know, concept of, of history repeating, you know, like time is, is kind of a circle, a ring. 
and you know that's obviously interesting but i'm just wondering how how these types of lyrics play play into that broader theme if they do you know i noticed that there's some definitely pretty uh political themes in the lyrics as well especially in the first track violent sure. astrology and you know uh, as we all know like over the past two years you know living in the united states the political situation has been you know pretty turbulent turbulent to say the yeah. least yeah there's been a lot of craziness there's been the covid pandemic i feel like just a lot of political polarization and you know all sorts of pretty just crazy events and i was wondering if um if if these you know if these events and this type of like political backdrop kind of influenced the lyrics on that song the album in general anything else about the band you know like what's the role that that politics kind of plays with this band if you know and maybe i'm um, overstating it but no no not not, not at all i mean it, it, when it comes to anything political um it really is just that song I, I guess, but uh, I mean, when I think about like when when you know I yes, of course, history you know is going to repeat itself, and you know we're doomed uh, to you know be victims of that for however long you and I live. But uh, you know, at the same time, like the other thing that I wanted to explore was like behaviors repeating themselves, people repeating themselves, and you know, going back to you know things that are toxic in your life after you know thinking you've purged it and that kind of thing and one of those things that i was dealing with was uh just family members of mine um you know going from you know posting punisher skulls on facebook and you know uh yeah. q yeah. shit on facebook and anti-vax shit on facebook and then being educated you know just like you know me trying my absolute damnedest along with you know my sister or you know my aunt or something like that just mm -hmm. to be like no 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 like this is this these are the real facts like these are these are the real things that are happening and then them being like oh okay well i see it now and then like you know next week it's another conspiracy theory that you know there were yeah you know whatever um so um if anything like the american flag line on on violent astrology when i say that it's it's not even really necessarily to do with like how much the country is failing um it's it's people it's more so just like you know all these things that my family members are justifying they're doing it under the banner of freedom you know they're doing it under uh this symbol that that is supposed to mean something and to me it's been bastardized to the point where it just i i, I feel fucking nothing um you know, it, it doesn't matter that, you know, that's supposed to be something that unifies all of us. Um, I don't get it. I don't get it anymore. Um, I don't understand patriotism. I don't understand uh, political mm -hmm. uh, alignment or affiliation. Um, it is it is completely and totally numb. And I think a lot of people my age and, and younger are feeling that. Um, and I, I see a wave of people who are just like, you know, and I've heard the term black pilled before, which I don't that's really know what that means. I don't know if I'm it's just uh, like a, um it's basically shifting to just like a, a pessimistic view of the world sure, like, oh, sure. oh, that, that's the black pill and that's well and and that's kind of where I'm at where as far as the country goes and as far as the world goes I'm not I'm not very excited to, <laughs> to see where it's going um, oh, yeah. and I don't really see much of it changing um but I don't want to just you know throw my hands up in the air and be like ah we're all fucked i want to keep making great records and i want to <laughs> improve myself and i want to love my friends and love my yeah. family and uh you know i think that it's it's hard to be friends with people who think it can improve and it's hard to be think friends with people who think it can't and are very nihilistic about it and it's hard to be friends with people who uh, don't think the world is going a bad direction at all and are totally fine with the political landscape i think it's it's very difficult, but I really want to love all those people. Like I know they they love me. So, yeah, I mean, I completely understand that. Like I I kind of agree. You know, there's a lot of of negativity in the world, especially you know, in this past year alone. There's just been like you know, in terms of global events, we had you know Russia invading Ukraine. Obviously, it's a tragedy. Oh, of course. And you know, literally, like I don't know. I think yesterday, Trump's coming back. You know, he wants round. Round yeah. two, pretty much. Like, you know, but I think, like you mm -hmm. said, it's always good to remain, you know, we can't take the black pill, you know, like we got to remain positive and everything. And yeah, I mean, obviously keep, you yeah. know, working on like on music and, and family, you know, that's obviously, I guess, a great way to kind of cope with all of this. But um, going yeah. going back to the more like, you know, musical 
side of things. So on your band on the band camp page for celebrity um for celebrity therapists, some of the influences that are mentioned on there are bands like Dillinger Escape Plan, The Chariot, Every Time I I Die, bands that I mean, don't get me wrong, like they're amazing. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of them as well. Definitely huge, huge, hugely influential on so many musicians that kind of fall into this into this realm of music. But at the same time, I'd say that they generally, you know, they're pretty avant-garde and experimental in their own right. But they, they kind of they tend to fit in with this broader, maybe like you could call it a, a like abrasive metalcore or or like you know sure. kind of off kilter sure. metalcore. That's not really a genre, but I feel like it's still a pretty good descriptor of those types of bands. But I noticed. Um, <laughs> Then I noticed two other bands on the list um, that don't quite fall into the same box category. You have Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy. And that was pretty intriguing to me because I've talked to so many people that are in the world of like metal and, and noise rock and, and, and metal cork, like experimental, any of these harsh abrasive genres that you want to talk about. And for a ton of them, sure, some of the first bands that they ever really got into were like those from the, those two exact bands. And like by Fallout Boy and Panic Oh Disco. yeah, that actually describes me perfectly too. Like, I remember some of the first bands I ever really got into back when you know I didn't even play instruments, didn't really know much about music. I I wasn't like trying to discover any music all the time. Were were bands like that, and um, I was just wondering, you know, this is kind of a, a maybe a more of a lighthearted question, but is this like an actual phenomenon that you've noticed too? <laughs> Is there like a middle ground between Fall Out Boy and, and Dillinger Escape Plan that a lot of people aren't picking up on? Like, what what do you think about this? Um, I can only I can only speak from my own experience, uh, and you know some some other uh, select musicians who who really like it. I mean, I was it's very funny. Uh, m- uh, my friend Moke who plays in uh who plays bass for Lorna Shore, he and I talk about Panic at the Disco all the fucking time. <laughs> like, um, I'll send him demos, and he's like. He was like, dude, this shit sounds like Panic of the Disco. I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> um, and and so I mean, I guess I could say that I've noticed the pattern as well. Um, to my experience, I mean, like those big choruses that those bands write, hugely oh, influential on on me and uh, you know, uh on our band too. I mean, Fallout Boy was really the first band that Maddie and I bonded over. Um, our guitar player, our guitar player and I just loved that band so much. Um and I, I can't really uh, think of like a, a reason behind it exactly, but like, like, you know, it's just, it's good music. And it's uh, I think for people our age, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 25, mm-hmm. uh, I'll be 26 in a few days, but uh, for, for people my age, I think like that might be like the introduction into the, you know, the deeper music scene. I found, I found the number 12 looks like you because of, my chemical romance mm, um yeah. because at one point in time they were signed to the same label <laughs> oh, oh. Um, which is crazy to think about you know yeah. um so i mean all of that stuff introduced me to the world that i'm in now um it's weird to be kind of uh connected to it still <laughs> um i still really really love those records and i don't think it's i don't think it's nostalgia um i think it's just you know oh shit Sorry. Yeah. Um. You know. Um, you I brought, think it's just that's oh, good music. Yeah. You know. You brought up. I now that I think about it. You. You brought up the the number twelve looks like you. I think. I think part of the connection is maybe like the the theatricality, of like that these types of bands uh kind of have in common and like you know this this sassiness like, and you mentioned like the line the you know, the, the line between like My Chemical Romance and Number Twelve looks like you. I mean, yeah. there's I don't, there's not a huge connection, I guess, aside from it being on the same label. But I feel like, you know, bands like, like Fall Out Boy and Panic at the Disco, I mean, obviously, they have a, a very different sound now. If you, like, listen to the yeah. new stuff, it's way more, you know, they took they kind of took the rock out of it and, and, and put in more like an electro pop song. And it just they're just completely yeah. different. But at least with their with their older material, I feel like there was this kind of like, you know, there's this theatricality. And a little bit of this, like, you know, this edge and, and this, like, darkness to for it. Sure. And I think that, sure. you know, like, for example, if you look at, you know, probably one of uh, Panic at the Disco's most famous songs, um, uh, I Write Sins, Not Tragedies, which, you know, still still a good song, even in 2020. Still great. Yeah. Still great. yeah. Um, I don't I actually don't think it's it's that, you know, bit hu- huge of a leap to go no, from not at all. that song to the number 12 looks like you. Because no. it's, it's still kind of like the the punk framework, but then they're just adding in for sure. 
Like, I mean, I would, I would say, uh, even, even to, to bring it all home, I think it's not a huge leap, uh, away from like all the stuff we do, you know, like I, I think that there's a bunch of spots on the record where I'm like, well, that's like very clearly like, you know, influenced by this panic of the disco song or very clearly influenced by this fallout boy song. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. We, we need, we need more bands in this realm that are influenced by panic and, and fall I agree. Up. <laughs> I agree. That's something that's really needed, I think. So, um, and then about the next question I'm going to ask is about, uh, just the songwriting process for, for the band. Is it, is it more or less democratic? Is it like one person coming up with the, the kind of the skeleton of the song and then everyone else adds to that? I mean, the music is just like, it's so dense and multi-layered and I can't even imagine how many different like tracks there are that, you know, you have to record and, and like, and mix. There's so many, there's so many little intricacies that like, I'm still picking up on multiple listens in and I'm just, so I can't even imagine how a single person could come up with all of this stuff. So I'm really curious as in, as to what the songwriting process looks like for the Callous Style Boys. Sure. Um, I mean, it's a it's a different beast every time, um, really. Uh, but usually, what it is is I will come up with the bones of an idea, sort of the skeleton of an idea, and bring it to the rest of the band, and we'll kind of all put our own spin on it, and you know, see what it needs, and and that kind of thing. Um. Uh, but I think the rule is that everybody has to be excited about it. Um, that's kind of how it goes is like, you know, uh, if we track something and everyone's like, eh, I'm not feeling this, then it's like, all right, then it dies. You know, it's, that's too bad. You know, we, it doesn't matter that we worked hard on it. You know, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, because I mean, you know, just as if we think as optimistically as possible, which we usually are. Um, you know, uh, we're hoping that, uh, we can, you know, play the song we just wrote for, you know, the next 10 years. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, that brings up the question, do we want to play the song that we just wrote for the next 10 years? Um, and the answer to that question always has to be yes. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a democracy in that, you know, we all have to be excited about the idea, but, um, you know, uh, usually, usually what happens is when I bring something to the table, it's like, okay, well, like this part needs to get cut or, um, this part needs more melodicism or, you know, this needs something a little bit more memorable. We have to change this, 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 um, it's a, it's a interesting process to be a fly on the wall for, I guess. Um, but I'm so used to it that like, I just, you know, when people are just like, I can't imagine what the songwriting process is like. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's just been my life for the last six or seven years. <laughs> um, so, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's the way it turns out is, is the way it comes out. And, you know, I, I don't really know uh, how to, uh, I don't really know how to uh, describe it other than that. I mean, what's like, what's it like to, to write all these parts as a vocalist? Do you like, do you, or do you still, because I know you mentioned that you play guitar. Do you still like sit down with the instrument or is it more yeah. like, a, like a digital type thing? Like specifically as a vocalist from that point of view, what's, what, what's it like you'd say? Yeah. I mean, so for me, um, I have just a lot of like, there's a lot I want to say. Um, there's a lot I have to say um, as far as lyrics go and, and lyricism goes. Um, there's a lot of, 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 uh, I, I mean, there's a lot of things I want to touch on in my head immediately, but uh, really the last thing we do on every song is figuring out what the lyrics are. Um, occasionally it's different. Um, Star Baby, for example, Star Baby, the lyrics were all written. Uh, all of it was written around the lyrics that I had. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, most of it is me picking up the instrument and just being like, okay, well, awesome. Like, this is a great riff what is this song about and what is this song about is usually the last question that we ask once the instrumental is like finished finished so mm -hmm. um and you know occasionally some things need to be changed around because of lyrics or you know whatever but um you know uh it i it's it's interesting as a vocalist to to look at it because you know it's it's almost more fun uh to start off that way because i'm not worried about what i have to do yet and then, you know, when the day comes around where it's like, this thing's been finished for like three or four weeks, why aren't there lyrics over it? And I'm like, 
all right, fine. <laughs> and yeah. it's not that I don't like doing it. It's just such a daunting task, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, see. I mean, so. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm just, but do you, in terms of like, do you, so is it like, but is it more like, do you sit down with the instruments or like, yeah. because there's so many yeah. different, oh, you do. It's just, there's so many different instrumentalists in the band. Yeah. I would imagine that like, you know, what if the if the like the drummer wants to put you know his own little like his fills in or whatever like there's probably there's probably a lot that goes into it in that regard right because of course everyone will have their own preferences i can imagine for like, sure I um so i mean like I, I can't play drums at all um mm -hmm. but uh i i you know I, I would describe myself as the main riff writer of this band i guess uh mm -hmm. as far as you know guitar goes um, and when I get on guitar, you know, I'll program the drums and, uh, you know, I'll play the key parts and I'll play the bass parts and stuff like that. But like, ultimately, like everyone's going to play the part the way that they play yeah. the part. So, um, you know, our, our bassist, Jackie, they change everything that I write. <laughs> like they're, they make everything, you know, a fucking mud vein bass line and <laughs> yeah. I got just so crazy. Yeah. I could, I could see some on the album. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. So then moving on, this is going to be um, in regards to, I guess, the location you got. You, I saw you guys are from Atlanta, Georgia, you know, not, it's not really the first place that most people think of when they think of like math core ex experimental music. You know, I guess the association is more like Migos or Young Thug sure. or something like that. I mean, I'm not necessarily I'm not saying those sure. guys are bad, but. You know that's probably the association but i was just wondering you know with that in mind like what, what's kind of the well what's the music scene in the atlanta area like was it i mean i know you, i saw you guys are from alpharetta specifically i've actually i was actually there earlier this year I, I mean i've been there multiple times i don't live in the atlanta area but i'm, I'm not i'm mm. from not far from there so i was just wondering like what's the atmosphere like in terms of the musical community like was it did you guys build a local following first is it like a supportive scene i mean what just in terms of the whole location and you know in the context of, of this band like what's your, um what's say? for for our music specifically um i i think it's an okay scene um i think it's very supportive um when you are participating in it um i think it's uh a little hard to get by when uh you're a band like ours because we don't really fit anywhere there isn't really a band that sounds exactly like us here not that's active anymore you know the chariot is from here but um you know they <laughs> oh wow they aren't you know uh, that. they aren't around anymore so yeah. um uh, it's a little hard to um it, it it's a little hard to make your way through it i guess um we got by just playing every show that was offered to us, you know, whether it was with, uh, you know, three other hardcore bands, whether it was with a rapper and like a pop band or an indie rock band, you know, that is like where we cut our teeth and, and gained the majority of our audience starting off um, was at these shows where we did not fit at all. Um, and I still don't know if the hardcore scene has like grandfathered us in yet. Um, I hope so one day. That'd be cool. I like hardcore. I'd like to play with some hardcore bands. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, early on, it would be like, hey, this band sounds like he's legend in the chariot. And people would be like, yeah, we don't want that on our hardcore bill. We're no, we're not doing that. And that's <laughs> fine. You know, they had, you know, it's just business at that point. But um, it was it was interesting for sure. Um, I think we have you know, not found our entire fan base yet. I hope not. I hope that we, you know, continue to grow and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to look back on it and just be like, wow, like we, we did not play a show with a band that sounded like us until, you know, probably our first tour really, yeah. uh, when we were touring with, uh, you know, bands like fall 50 feet and, uh, you wow. know, gray Haven and, and stuff like that. So, I mean, like, yeah. Really, when you think about it, it, it's kind of isolating, but at the same time, like, I mean, we don't care. Like, <laughs> we yeah, we well. are, you know, we're here to do our thing and we're here to put on the best show possible. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, whatever sure. bill we're on, we're going to give 100%. Yeah, that's great. Um, It looks like we're going to have to wrap this up soon. I see there's, there's a timer on the Zoom, yeah. but I just really wanted to finish this one last question. Sure. Kind of, uh, just to finish it off, I think it'd be good to wrap it up with... uh. 
if so, if you could collaborate with any musician, alive or dead, who would it be? And maybe a brief explanation. Probably not an easy question. For uh, I guess, no, but... it's a very. It's I have a very oh, really? easy, simple, just immediate answer. Uh, oh, wow. Bjork. Bjork. Bjork? It, it, oh wow. Be Bjork, a hundred percent. Um, I adore her. Uh, she is. Uh, I mean, probably my biggest musical influence as of late. Um. I, I think she's pretty much all I've been listening to for the past, huh. like, I don't know, year and a half. Um, I, I love her and I love her music. And I think that we could make something really amazing together. Um, just, I just, you know, I, I know exactly what kind of record we would make with her. And I think it would be really cool. So, yeah, there you go. that's awesome. I never actually never really listened to that much Bjork. Okay. Which is really because like, you know, I've heard that sleepy time gorilla museums, like, female vocalist apparently you know sounds a lot like her is influenced by her so apparently it should be like a logical yeah. step but I'll, I'll definitely have to check out more of her material because i've from what i've heard i mean yeah she's really really good as you say and like a, check a out um check out the album post check out the album vespertine and then check out utopia uh those yeah. three records are like perfect to me yeah i mean yeah definitely will so in that case that about wraps it up so Carson Nicholas Dow Boys, thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. All right, that about wraps it up.